right. Welcome back, everybody. Chris Garlock here with Michael Redmond for our latest live stream. Uh, this is the uh, next in our AlphaGo versus AlphaGo series, uh, game 54, with one more to go. I'm, I'm getting kind of excited, Michael. It's uh, good to <laughs> be wrapping this up finally. Right. Yeah. We will Hi, be Chris. back. We'll be okay. We'll be back uh, January uh, with with our last one, and this is uh, partly because we wanted to finish this, and also partly because we're working on volume three of mm -hmm. the uh, AlphaGo uh, book. So this uh, which will give us a nice thing. All right, we're going to follow our usual format here. Just to check in with Michael, see what he's been up to, uh, and then we'll take a look uh, at the game itself. So just a reminder. Um, Go ahead, and uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, Eva D will be monitoring that uh, in the stream chat, and we will try and uh, answer those questions or comments. Um, so, Michael, good to good to see you again. And uh, what 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 have you been up to? Oh yeah, well I um I'm in my second semester of teaching at Chiba University, so um, every year I teach um beginners and then there's a more advanced class for people who have gone through the beginners class so that's two semesters and for the first time in a few years now um we're back to face to face so i'm, I'm actually teaching the children the, the students that's their they're, um, university students yeah um let's see there's um when it was online actually the good thing about doing it online was that there was no limit to the number of people who could Part participate and there was something like 600 people in the um um in the beginners class and then something like two or three hundred in the more advanced class and they they get to the point in the beginners class they get to the point where they um can finish a game on a 19 by 19 board mm. so they start on a smaller board and they move up to the 1919 board and they can they can count the game basically that's the the final goal is for them to be able to understand how to count the game um in japanese rules so it's sort of like the western rules i rules i would guess so like um it it takes a lot of understanding to be able to actually count the game on the board actually <laughs> um, so that's the final goal and then then i start teaching them joseki's two joseki's for the intermediate class there's the, there's uh, some very basic joseki's that they can use throughout their career if they continue playing golf and are you using AI at all, or, or are they using AI? Does it factor into your teaching? Is that, has that changed at all? I think that's a bit too much, uh, too technical for most of the people at that level. So Got I, it. I, I, I talk about it in general um, when I'm not talking about Go situations in particular. And I, I tell them that this move is approved by AI sometimes, like when I <laughs> talk about Susaku's Gosumi and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, you know, a lot of times I talk about tennis, but of course, I've also taken up pickleball and I was thinking about Go because mm -hmm. one of the big attractions of pickleball for folks is that unlike tennis, which takes quite a long time to get any good at, mm -hmm. um, just for people in tennis to be able to hit the ball back and forth with any control, it takes it takes a while. Right. I can take an absolute beginner uh, onto the court and pick a ball and have them actually moving onto a, a fairly decent level mm -hmm. uh, in, in one session. I was thinking about that with your teaching with, with yeah. Go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the face-to-face, -face, it's more like something, the class, the room only hosts, um, it hosts up to 200 people. Mm. But um, So it's the biggest room they have. But because of the go boards and all i think it turns out to be something like 100 people who can come to the class so it's a mm -hmm. it's less people yeah definitely but it's it's more intimate because i'm actually there so it's it, there's pros and cons so it must be nice to actually be back in 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 a in, it's been in a physical space with folks i would think right yeah th that's a difference yeah definitely okay all right uh so uh AlphaGo versus AlphaGo, game 54. Uh, we should tell folks, we, we had a little bit of, I don't know if I'd call it controversy, yeah, yeah, order, but a little, conf a little confusion. Uh, so people who are really sharp may notice this may not actually be game 54. Yeah, well, um, the thing is, um, 
the um, source for these games, one of the sources was a group of uh, a set of videos that a Chinese um, company put out on the internet. And they asked, I think I remember they actually had someone from DeepMind who was ex helping them explain the games, telling them stuff about some insider knowledge about what was going on with the um, after the game, what what was what AlphaGo was commenting, give, showing about it and stuff mm. like that. Mm. So it's really interesting. Um, and you can find these games on the Internet. But the source that I found actually has them listed as V1 to B5. And the order is slightly different from what we've been doing. So there's there was some confusion there. Um, I think the game we're doing today, although we're calling it 54, um, in that order, it was actually V5. So depending on where you saw the games, you might think that we're doing them in the wrong order. But of course, like this is like I, some unimaginable number of games that AlphaGo played against itself. And someone, I would assume a strong player from DeepMind, maybe Fang Hui himself, um, chose these games to show us. So I'd, I'd say the numbering is pretty arbitrary anyway. I, I kind of love that, that, you know, when you look at the really old game records, right? Uh, where, you know, somebody that went on for a couple of days and were written down, and but that that there are sometimes, you know, some questions about, you know, what happened with this game, who actually, you know, what, what, so I love that even now, hundreds of years later, we, we have kind of the same issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you would, you would think it all be resolved by now. So it, it kind of connects us to our, to our go history mm -hmm. as well. So, all right. With that taken care of, um, we're calling it 54 and, and we right. are controlling our own reality. So, <laughs> yep. That's um, it. What what what's the top line? What are we what are we looking at? I mean, it's it's AlphaGo versus AlphaGo, so I'm sure there's going to be lots of back and forth and confusing things. But what's what's your top line on this game? It does get pretty wild to start with in the beginning, from the opening that is. But um, and then in that middle game, it does it gets a bit more positional. So it's you get to see both sides basically. Cool. And then, of course, there's the end game, but we'll we'll get to that. I suppose we'll get to the end game. All right, <laughs> end game. Well, that's, that's that's our favorite part. All and right. Also, it's going to sort of repeat some ideas that it showed earlier. So this is actually it's uh, what I'm calling the master version of AlphaGo, um, and it's a very advanced um, version because uh, this these games were disclosed in 2017 at the Go Summit that was in China, where AlphaGo defeated KJ in a five game match. Right. So um, they were later, I would assume they were later than the games that I are in what I would call the master series, uh, which is some, I see it sometimes called the, called the Taijin Fox series because it was a series of games where AlphaGo played 60 games against top professionals mm -hmm. on the internet. And, um, and in this game, I'm seeing some similarities. So I'm going to be flashing back to some of those games that it played earlier including a game from this series nice all right all overlapping oh by the way quick question before we go to the game uh somebody from the chat is wondering how you would teach 600 people when you were doing the online stuff um at a um, time well i've had a lot of practice <laughs> and teaching beginners is it's actually very difficult for strong players uh, i think ideally like you should be a double digit q if you're teaching beginners for the first time, really, why the week the you have to remember what problems they have ah. because they're they're not understanding things that if you're um, even a um, moderately strong player, you're not even thinking about that anymore, and Got so it. you have to uh, be very consciously um, talking about those things. So I've I've um, after many mistakes. Um, in the past years, I've, I've finally come up with a kind of a system. And I, I think I finally, what really cemented it into what I'm doing right now is the fact that I actually made a set of videos on the internet. So um, on, on my YouTube channel. So there's a beginner's uh, videos, um, which were made for this class. It, they were made for this class when it went online. And I had, and I used all my knowledge that I had accumulated and I sort of remade it 
into a set of videos that I hoped that people could learn to play Go just by watching those videos. And so I, I, I think I've improved a lot, at least from what I was doing, like when I was a teenager and I was a strong player and I was just enjoying beating up people. <laughs> it was quite <laughs> different. <laughs> so I'm, I think I've moved forward from there. Um, I would hope so. Not perfect. I'm, I, I think I still, I still try to tweak it every year as I do this, but teaching college students is an experience. I, uh, one interesting thing that I learned from it is that depending on their age and, and what they're doing academically, it, it really changes how people learn the game. So like hmm. children, small children, they just sort of learn it intuitively. So I tend to do best if I don't teach them very much and I just let them play and then they'll get better. Well, while older people like um, college students, they, they want to know why. And so I have to be a bit more um, going to an explanation there. Oh, no, it totally. I was just thinking that when I'm teaching pickleball, I, I found the same thing. I taught a, a 10 year old the other day and I didn't have to tell him. How, I, was, I just show, I would show him something and yeah. he just sort of intuitively picked it. Was, but, but then there was an older person I was teaching and he wanted to know why this, why that. It was driving me crazy, right. actually. And it really helps people of that age to, to grasp it if you if you give them a reason. And so there's, there is a completely different way of learning stuff. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Very, very cool. Excellent questions. Keep those coming. We will uh, try and answer them all. All right. Let's take a look at the uh, at the game. OK. Um, so uh, black plays the Kakari, white plays the Kakari. So um, there's an idea at this point where some people would just be pressing it like myself. Um, I would just be pressing here at E16. Mm -hmm. And this would be an opening, so like this kind of thing. Um, where black is thinking of building on the left side, but just for the time being is forcing white to a low position on the top side. And this is what I would call an even opening. It's, it usually gets, well, it gets pretty close um, scores, depending on which um, which AI you're using, I suppose. <laughs> and what the how the comey is set and all that stuff right. so it's close enough for me um but then alpha go in the master version it came up with this idea of kicking here and the virtue of kicking is that it's a relatively forceful move when black has kicked here and played the knight's move at three then the pincer the value of a pincer somewhere on the l or m line has increased so if white plays if white plays away um, then black will probably uh, pincer somewhere around here. And the group is sort of, um, it's a nihilist white group that's going to have to move out into the center. So there's some, um, this is a this is a fight too, but the idea of kicking there and by uh, increasing the value of an extension on the top side, making white want to extend and then pressing here. And so the idea is that um, in a variation like this, Sometimes that stone at four, the extension at L16, can become a little redundant. So like, if you imagine this whole sequence to 12 um, being played already, then after that, white would not be playing that stone at four. White would find somewhere else to play. So the whole idea is starting with one and three there and forcing white to play a slightly redundant move at four. And so I'm going to jump back to the beginning of the game. I'm going to show you a completely different game, um, which was played by AlphaGo in the what I'm calling the Master Series, or what mm -hmm. some people are calling the Taijin Fox Series, um, in which it was this opening, and AlphaGo was white. Black was Lan Shao. I think it was game 17 of that series. So game 17 of the 60 games it played on the internet. And it played this way. And so this is a variation we see. It's a bit passive in the top corner, but it does have the same effect of making the value of an extension on the left side, in this case, really big. So it, um, it's expecting that Black's going to play some kind of an extension on the left side, after which White can press here. And again, the idea will be that that extension at D11, sometimes it can be a bit redundant if after White pushes here. Like Black's so strong on the left side, just looking at the lower left corner, that black would not want to play that extra move at d11. So that's the idea here. So this was played in the game against Lenshaw. 
um, who is a nine down. He's one of the strong players in China. And Lan Xiao played here, AlphaGo pincer. So if, when White has played that kick at C16 and then gets to pincer also, Black does have this heavy group that Black has to deal with. So that's the idea for White here. We should mention, by the way, that those are all covered in volume two of our AlphaGo book. And um, uh, Eva D can put the link to that uh, in the right. chat. Makes a very good holiday present. Mm -hmm. and just just mm -hmm. saying. Okay. So back to the game. It's the same idea here where Black could have kicked, uh, kicked and done this. Um, something like this or, or this way, right? But it right. didn't do that. It, it played a Shimari first. White played a pincer. And now it's doing that. So this mm. is much more tacky than the previous variation because White mm -hmm. has an extra stone at, at C11. Um, again, just to um, highlight the idea of kicking there, if Black plays a knight's move here, now this is not so forcing. So because in the case that Black already has that stone at Q14, White's not going to extend at P16 because there's no added value to that move. And White's probably going to play something on the side. And when Black continues to play moves to kill that stone at P17, now it's the stone at Q14 that becomes a bit redundant. It's a place where Black would not be playing. If we could take this stone off the board, Black would not be playing there after the after the shape in the top right corner. And so that's why Black kicks first just to make it more urgent for white to be playing, continuing to play on the top side. So if white plays here, again, black's probably gonna play some kind of a pincer. Um, and whether this is gonna be on the M line or the L line, it, it sort of depends. So something like this. This would be a fight, but the idea would be to isolate that white group in the top right and, and chase it around. So white extended. So up to this point, it's sort of going according to plan by Black. And Black continues with the pressing move. Uh, so if White were to answer underneath, then Black would extend. Probably uh, when you have hopes to attack this Black group on the left, sometimes you see White playing a knight's move. So uh, the difference between this knight's move and a high move, let's see, back, back to the same, the right, this move, is that um, when white jumps on the third line, it's relatively easy for black to play these forcing moves. And that means that the black group is going to be relatively strong. So it's going to be relatively safe. Whereas if when white plays the knight's move, um, black doesn't have any forcing moves, except for this move, which is just bad. It's, it's just, it, it's improving white more than it improves. Mm. Um, so black's going to play something like this. Um, so we would have seen this, in which case black has pressed white down on the top side and it's sort of working for black. This is pretty, it's close enough to be even so that if you're in this position with white and you don't want to get into a big fight, uh, you can choose this. It's, it's not a game losing choice. But of course, AlphaGo is not afraid to get into a fight. And so white pushes through and cuts. So this is really wild. Like, if you're not comfortable with fighting, I would advise you not to get into this variation. <laughs> <laughs> that is very good advice. By the way, um, good question here about um, uh, were there any Taish, Taisha variations in the uh, AlphaGo, AlphaGo games? I, I'm trying to remember. Do you? Do you? Um, there might have. I have. I don't have a strong memory. Like, yeah. there were some. Uh, it did play the Taisha a few times. Um, in the games against humans, so this right, is a right, series. and um, I I was seeing it in the AIs that were sort of derived from the same idea as AlphaGo. So it's, mm. it's something that can happen, um, and it depends on various. It actually depends, like in this kind of position, um, it would be just too dangerous for Black. But in this kind of position, where um, if we just look at the top left corner, mm -hmm. it, it strangely depends a lot on what's happening in the top right corner also. So sometimes a stone, um, a black stone in the top right corner will help black in the variations that, for instance, Katago plays from the Taisha. And hmm. so there's a lot of, um, I could I could make a whole video about that, but uh, it would be very difficult for me also. 
So like it, it would be very challenging. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it played it. Maybe it played it once or twice, but um, I don't, probably not in a simple opening position. It would probably have a lot of context with more stones on the board, which would make it less less powerful as a suggestion to me. Like I, I think it would be a, a case by case move rather than something that was played a lot in wide open positions. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Good question. Keep them coming. Okay, so white pushes through. We get into this variation. And it's challenging. Um, so actually, the one thing that you black wants to know is that if black wants to attack this these two white stones in the corner, there's two directions. That, and so there's basically, there's two moves that black can choose from. And it's either this one from the right or this one from the corner. So it really, um, this the direction black plays will change the health of the adjacent black group. So it's, it's not just the white stones, but it's also the black stones. So for instance, if black plays this slide, it's um, sort of flexible in the way that it's helping the black group on the left there. And white can attack, this is the key point in the corner, or white can slide first if white wants to be careful. So if white slides here, white would be making me eye of escaping to the right um, and playing this move after all in the corner. And the fun dirt variation, uh, sorry, I'm getting lost. Oh, I'm really getting lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> the fun variation is when white plays here and black tries to punish it. Um, but this is bad suji, bad shape. Um, if black plays this way, then black might think he's killing the corner. And like, if we get into a normal race to capture, maybe black's going to win by one move. Mm -hmm. So that would be, for instance, this kind of race to capture where the corner has three liberties and black has four. So black might be thinking that black's going to win this race to capture, but we have the famous stone pillar Tesuji. Well, I just saw this in the game the other day, actually. And yeah, it's, the rest is easy, of course, but the whole thing dies. Uh, so, where did my liberties go? Yeah. So yes, so that, that doesn't really work. Um, I could have fun with other variations, but the bottom line is that black will have trouble killing the white group in the corner. And with this white stone on the side, on the third line here, black's going to be jumping out at, at D13 anyway, just because black doesn't really have very much space on the side. Uh, let's let's go into the other variation just a little bit. If black plays here, um, let's let's do it this way. Um, this is a case where actually you might be surprised to know that white's actually going to play an empty triangle here, and that's because the other moves are not alive. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very simple reason. So if white okay. plays, you would usually think the shape move is uh, eight B sixteen here. But the, the best white can get now is a co. So th this would be a co like this, and white would immediately lose it and would lose the game mm, because mm. black's not going to answer anything. Um, but if white connects, um, and this is not a living shape. So for locally, it's a dead shape if black plays, for instance, at B18. Um, black would have to escape first. So there's still still some excitement going on. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation for white. So... White would usually, um, the move to remember is to play here. And this heads towards the Carpenter's Square, because if Black plays this way, it's really easy for White to live. It's better for Black to go straight down, and we get the Carpenter's Square, which is, you know, it's really difficult. I probably shouldn't go into this very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's basically a, a shape that where you quite often get three Black stones inside the White territory. And the question is whether it's going to be a seki or a dead three shape. And and like I could go on for the whole morning. It's morning it's just, for me right now. Right, right, right. I could right. go on for the whole morning with this shape alone. It's it's Friday night here and we're all having our Friday night drinks. So yeah, let's not do that. Let's not do that. But uh, the bottom line is that it's very difficult to kill this white group. And so in most cases, one of the black outside group is one of the black groups is going to die first. Right. That's all people need to know. Very difficult to kill white. Leave it alone. 
It might not happen that way in your own games, but that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> the local results may be may be different, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh so black jumped out. So black's leaving the option of playing from the right or the left and is jumping out first because I think the move he sort of wanted to the you would usually want to play would be this one. But since it doesn't black doesn't really have enough room to make a comfortable life and is going to want to jump out anyway. Black jumped out first, so leaving the option of playing at e18 or b17. Um, just because Black's in so much trouble locally here with these two white stones on the adjacent sides, it means that Black has to be very flexible in how it how it continues. So Black's leaving the option of playing it this way or this way, depending on how White reacts. Right. And if White pushes through and cuts, White can't do this. This is bad because Black can actually immediately caps her because um, the three stones in the center and the two stones on the side is me. I one or the other is going to die. So that's, that's how the jump is working locally. Uh, Feel free right. to ask questions if I'm not. Making yeah, sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I will jump in there. I should just show people that really quick. Cause I think it's, it's, um, it's one fairly. Yeah. Obvious. I mean, I went through that a bit too much. Too yeah. Quickly. Just to push cut oh, and then one. black has two options. Right. Yeah. So, um, Black could push first even, but it's it's better Suji just to put play here and go after the two stones. And so you locally white can capture the two black stones, but these would just die. The top, the top ones, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's like incredibly thick for black. That would be yeah, for a pro that would be the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um and then the other thing so too that I just that I just wanted to note for folks is is that in addition to the fact that 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 you know, the main thing is that white just is unlikely to die in the corner, but it's also that, you know, black, want, you want to get out. You get out before you try and kill, unless you can absolutely right. kill. And you say what, it's unlikely that white's going to die in the corner. Uh, but that's, that's what you that's, said. And... Well, yeah, I, maybe I said that too. <laughs> You're going to see a big, uh, <laughs> I... a big black territory there in the end. <laughs> it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be pretty, but yeah. So white plays here and black crawl. So tactically speaking, maybe white can push through and cut now. And it's a bit more complicated. Oh, so right. That's through. right. With the extra stone there, it makes a difference. That's right. So this is a bit tricky. So like if we just go through it straightforwardly and say that white's going to take the two stones, it actually doesn't work for white because black has the clamp here. And this is going to capture the three white stones on the outside. Oh, that's very nice. That's lovely. Um, but there is the question of whether this is going to be good enough for black. I actually didn't check this with the computer, but like this, this kind of way, black stones in the corner would be in danger. Mm. Or black could capture the two stones like this, but it might not be good enough because the way black has captured these two stones is a bit clunky. It's it's not the most satisfying way to capture is two it, stones. Is B B sixteen looks a little scary. And well, black doesn't black's out in the center for the time being, but like black has a lot of issues with that group on the top side, and B sixteen taking away black's eyes. There's an idea that maybe white can surround from the center with a move like this, like uh, F. 11. Yeah, I love it. I was just thinking that. Yeah, that that's pretty. Yeah, it, I I don't like this for. Black. Well, I sort of doubt this for black. So just to back up a little bit, it might be easier actually in this case when white has played this exchange to focus on the fact that that exchange is bad for white in the corner. It's making it more difficult for white in the corner. Got it. And maybe black's just going to play like this. So when black plays like this and slides into the corner, black will be able to live. So this is alive. So Oof. just to give a relatively simple variation where black makes two eyes and white makes two eyes, and then black can push through and cut and capture this stone. So I'd, I'd say this is more clearly good for black than the other variation, which was sort of questionable. This this way, black is alive on the left side, um, and white was squeezed in the corner too, and black got this great shape on the right. So uh, considering that it started out with a position that looked like it was going to be a crash for black, <laughs> this is a pretty good result. And, and of course, the rest of the board, Black has a positional advantage. So a good local result is is very good for Black. Okay. 
I didn't check this one with the computer either, but I'm pretty sure it would give a good score. Okay, so black rolled and white did not push through and cut. Instead, now white protects the corner. So in this case, white is threatening black on the left side and the top side by living in the corner first. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wonder if you have a kind of a deju, deja vu uh, feeling because this is the second time uh, AlphaGo has played this game. I think it was game number 49. So I'm oh. going to show you a variation. Well, the game move was here. So the problem with this move is that it's it's not easily easy to understand that white is alive in the corner because there's this move in the corner, which provided black's group on the right is reinforced a little bit, it's going to be a problem. So there's this potential problem in the corner which is going to be the focus of the following fight. So the thing is that if white had played here, it would have been very easy to see that this white group was alive. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it turns out that AlphaGo actually played this way in a previous game. So I, I'm oh. pretty sure it was game number 49. And so it's interesting to see that um, in the master version, they allowed it to, to play various ways. And so uh, I would say that I would just, assume that the score given to these various moves is very close. And um, for some reason, I don't know, maybe it could be the the way that the amount of time they allowed it to to think. Um, it was on a super, the Google supercomputer. So it was mm. obviously calculating at a, a huge, much more fast than even the best AIs we have now, which work on personal computers, of course. Um, but um, for some reason, it, it it was able to choose different moves in the same position. So it's not as if it was finding the best moves. It was just finding good moves. And I think that's the a definition of how it works. So just to show you this variation without, uh, for the detailed commentary, you have to, I think it's game 49. So you have to look at the video <clears throat> or it will come out in the book when we finally. So here, yeah, 14 is the fun move, which is, White was threatening to capture those two stones in a ladder, but Black wanted to cut at J15. So it was finding a way to extend the liberties there while threatening to cut at J15. And so they got into this fight. And um, okay, so the Black group on the top there is not yet alive. It needs one more stone there to, to be alive. So that that is half alive. Uh, White's group is not alive. And everything lives in the end. So so it turned out um, everything lived for the time being, at least, if I recall correctly. But um, this kind of fight. So it's a completely different fight. I'll leave it there. Like this, That's not the subject of this video. But I thought it was fun to see how it com had a completely different variation there. Mm. Now white plays here. Now black's idea is he's going to punish white. It's going to punish white for leaving that weakness at B18. So that's the general idea that Black has here. So uh, in this variation, Black attached here and played here and is moving out to the center. So you can see he, he it did play that B18 move, but it's not ready to continue with it yet. So just to talk about that a little bit more, Black will, in order to attack strongly, Black does have to play the extension. Pushing through them from this side um, in this case, jumping out to the right and capturing in the corner, or white could just capture on the corner here. Um, white would be able to live. So that's not the most forceful way for black to play. The more forceful move is to play here and make a group of four, after which black has to reinforce on the right. And so um, I'll just tease you a bit and leave it here. So you, you have to figure out what's going to happen in the corner. But it's yeah. gonna, it's pretty close in the future of this game also. So we can talk about it in more detail when it actually happens. Okay. So Black moves out. White pushes. Okay. So the problem here that Black has is that there is a hole at H16. So I'm talking about this point. So when White extends at H15, um, White is going to be threatening to... And, to surround black mm. while threatening the hole at h16 so that's a problem that black has to deal with and for the time being black is going to deal that deal with that 
in connection to the corner. So for instance, if black had simply played here and white extended, then black would be forced with a kind of dilemma because when black tries to get out and white connects, there's no time to deal with h16 and j14 at the same time. There's still mm. this double threat there. So this would be like, it would be, uh, yeah, Let, let's leave that one. So um, what black did in the game was it started with this and it's fixing that weakness at h16. Oh, clever. All right. So, uh, well, you still have to think about what happens in the corner. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later. But for, for now, the idea is that if white plays the extension here, um, actually, you have to be careful because if black just moves out, white can push through and cut. And black is in a shortage of liberty. So black's not going to be able to save that group. So the way black deals with that is that black has this forcing move here, which is threatening to connect at F19. And white has to answer that, after which black can push through. And so that extends the liberties of black stones and makes it possible to play on the outside. And now black can capture the cutting stone. Nice. And by the way, with white three in this diagram, if white had played at G19, that would fill a liberty, but it would be really bad for white stones in the corner. So white doesn't want to do that. Right, right, right. Wow. And, and in that case, black would not crash, but would play a different variation and kill the corner instead. Okay, so back to the game. Um, here, so since white could not extend and kill black in that fashion, um, it played this move. So white's trying to enclose the black group, uh, putting some pressure on it. So if black had tried to squeeze out this way, white would probably use some more pushes in the center and then eventually surround black. I mean, pushes on the left side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So black plays here and it's squeezing out. But while black tries to squeeze out, there is a problem and it's really annoying if white gets to play at J18. So if black plays something like this and white plays here, um, the value of this is that it gets rid of all white's problems in the corner. Nice. It's really big as far as territory is concerned, and it takes away black space. So it's a lot of good things happening for white, and it's a bit annoying for black. Because white doesn't have any weak stones now. It's just the weak black stones, and there's two of them also. So black doesn't want this to happen. So it actually played this move. So it played all those moves trying to squeeze out, but actually it wasn't doing that. It was playing here, and white surrounded the black group, um, but black and black's not even alive yet. <laughs> but white has some problems on the outside too, so it sort of evens out. All right, right. So you're, talking, you're talking about how black black has some, yeah, can activate the G14 stone, the J14 maybe. Uh, yeah, all of them, all of them have possibilities. But Got black it. might start with the J14. If we just look at the G14 stone on its own. This variation is probably not working so well. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do it that way. <laughs> Let's do it this way. Yeah, and white can push through on the left. So it's it's not working so well locally. Um, right. But um, I would I would guess like I haven't um, I didn't go into detail in my study of this one, but I would guess it would be this this side threatening a ladder there. And then oh yes, that's there. very nice. And you have to remember, black does have this forcing move against uh, them. Actually, pretty white white does have to go to some extremes to kill that black group also. So I think black would actually win the race to capture. Or at least, yeah, something like that. We'll leave it there, because I'm probably going to make a mistake fairly soon. <laughs> but no, white connects. never. Yeah. OK, so now black's going to be able to, to live. Yeah. But he started with that. Yeah, it started with that. And you can see them doing a lot of stuff on the way. So the, the bottom line is, now I'm going to talk about what happens in the upper left corner. Mm. Because it's actually, it's a co. But it's not a direct co. That's why Black didn't start it yet. Um, so in the game, I think we saw Black start with F19. 
It doesn't mm-hmm. really matter whether black starts with this move or c19, but it's probably a more direct, a more one-way street if black starts with this exchange and then plays here. And whatever white does, it's going to be a one-step call. So it's a call like this. And after this, black has to play two more moves. So black can uh, push here, but needs one more move, one more stone at h19. Or maybe black will play from this. Oh my side. god! Stone at h19 to actually start the call. And so one thing that I can tell you about a one-step call is that since it's not direct, you need basically if white takes the call now, you need a call threat. <laughs> and then when it becomes a direct call, you need a second call threat. So you yeah, need a yeah. minimum of two, uh, you need a two call threat advantage. And the second thing I'm going to say is that white, in this case, and in many cases, white has an opportunity to get rid of all of your call threats by playing a defensive move like this. So this would erase all of black's call threats. And black would not be able to start the call. So that's one of the things that white can do in this case of a one-step call where white has the advantage. So white can uh, just take away black's call threats. A stone at eight is a it's a useful place to have a stone anyway. And the thing is that if white plays at J17 on the way to winning the call, then like if black plays here and you would, might say, uh, what about playing two moves on the left side? White actually gets to play kill the black group or at least start killing the black group on the way. To, to to living on the on the in the corner. So th- there's there's a um problem there. Black has to go back to the top side actually. Anyway, so um if black starts the co, then the problem is that white can get rid of his the co threat. So black's not gonna do this yet, maybe that didn't do it yet. Um and I I'd say the reason for that would be that white could play here to get rid of black's co threats. So that that's something you do have to um, pay attention to when it's a step goal. It's, when it's a step goal. This is not There's for the faint-hearted, is it? Right. So black start. This is what black is doing with this. Black is trying to uh, create a code threat that cannot be erased. And so we're going to see how black does that uh, by playing here. So this is this is sort of the key move. It was really fun for me to go through variations where black didn't play that. Uh, so, so this is the same so, code again. So somebody wants to know what what Joseki this is. I think we may be a little out of Joseki land at this point, right? I, I, I think. I think. Um, yeah. Um, like I, I'd say that the Joseki you need to know for <laughs> Komoku is um, just you can go with the Kosumi. <laughs> that, that's I'm, I'm, I, I've been going with the Kosumi since yeah. Shusako taught it to me. Like if your opponent plays a low kakar, you can play the Kosumi. If you yes. play the high. If your opponent plays a high kakar, you can go with the skeiki, the attachment and pulling back. And Keep that's it. what I'm teaching my uh, college students, actually, in the in, in the advanced class. Yep, yep. And that yep. those two josekis will generally get you a good score with an AI. And they're, they're relatively easy to understand because the problem with josekis is your opponent is probably not going to play the joseki move always. Right. Especially right. if you go into one of the complicated ones. And chances are you don't know what to do against such a non Joseki move. Yeah. Yep. And so with the value of playing a Joseki that has a short number of moves is that you probably have a pretty good it's easier to get a good idea of what each move is trying to do. And um also it's easier to remember what your opponent should have done. And that that provides a hint as to what you do. Um when your opponent doesn't do it, it, it uh, just used to back in the day when I was, I can't remember how strong it was at the time, but probably a Q player. And there was a guy who, who had memorized, you know, a lot, a lot of Josekis and he would get really mad at me because he'd play the Josekis and I would, you know, do what you said. I, I would, I mean, not intentionally, but I, you know, because I didn't know the Joseki, I would play the wrong move and he would tell me that's the wrong move. And I was like, yeah, okay. But he wouldn't know what to do with it. So it's right. Like, um and it's yeah it's really um and josekis they're not like gospel or anything like even strong players can get away with playing non joseki moves like mm. and uh i i think alpha go is a great example of that because it played a lot of moves that we thought were they were almost like 
taboo moves that we thought everyone had decided that they were bad. And AlphaGo was showing us that they were actually in certain positions, they were really good. And so it, it changed the Joseki landscape. Right, right. And a lot of those complicated Josekis that we play when we play pincers and stuff, um, they're pretty, a lot of them to a certain degree have been refuted, or at least we know that um, they get bad scores with computers. And sometimes we understand why to a certain degree. And and like the opening, it's it's really tough for humans. I, I think it's um, reasonable enough to keep it simple. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, I sort of digressed uh, from what I was the point I was trying to make. Uh, it I think that the it suffices to say that by playing this Atari now before things heat up in the corner, it's still a position that can be a step cool or not. So it, it's still relatively calm in the corner. It hasn't started quite yet. So Black's playing this move because in some cases, capturing those two white zones, they wouldn't it wouldn't be good enough. So maybe I should show you that variation, yeah. Just just to give you an example of when it might not be good enough to capture the two stones would be a position like this where everything's going to die, right? So once black gets started, it, it gets really serious on the left side. And taking those two white stones, although like they say this shape is supposed to be worth 60 points, um, it's not always true. And actually... The turnover in the top left corner, that, that's pretty close to 60 points in real territory. Mm. If you count the territory that black would get capturing those white stones in the corner and the territory that white has now, and it's actually pretty close to 60 points. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Kame no Ko 60 points, the turtle shell 60 point pr proverb. Um, it's Actually, it's not as true as the Ponnuki proverb, which says the Ponnuki is 30 points. Mm -hmm. uh, in the center mm -hmm. of the board like this, if it was a ponuki, it would be probably worth 30 points. Um, but the turtle shell, which is this shape where black has captured two stones, um, they just doubled it randomly, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's because not because, because one stone is 30, so two stones must be 60, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the ponuki, it depends on where the ponuki is. So you, you need a very a good ponuki to make it really 30 points. I think it also sort of points out the the, uh, the those kind of things are shorthand, but they're also not necessarily. It's just it sounds it's, it's it has to be memorable. If it's a good right, problem. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. People so are people black... are happy. They they've learned the turtle shell from you. So I think right. our work is done here, Michael. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, turtle shells are supposed to be very auspicious. You know, people in ancient times they used. Oh to, yeah. To tell fortunes. Okay. So Black played an Atari early on before it started the co. And now it's starting the one-step co. And the thing here is that it's relatively difficult for White to get rid of the co threats because um, now there's an issue with those white stones on the left. I'm talking about, I'll mark them, the, the, the E line of stones here. There's an issue with these stones that could, in some cases, get captured also. Mm -hmm. so like, uh, let's try a variation, like if White... If white can uh, get rid of the cultures on this side, yeah, sure. Uh, but maybe white's going to lose these stones on this side. So something like that. So there's multiple threats, and white cannot get rid of all uh, of them. Oh, that's so painful. Ouch, so ouch, has, ouch. By creating two, two co-threats, and white cannot get rid of both of them, that means that black's going to win this call. Although it's a, a one-step code that's advantageous for white uh, locally, black is probably going to win it. Like there, it, there's still nuances, but black's probably going to win it. Taking three stones in the center, that's going to be big enough. That's going to be a lot bigger than the turtle shell we were talking about earlier. So capturing these white stones in the center of the board, these three white stones, that's going to be big. I think we're going to have so, to call that an armadillo shell. Armadillo, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so I cut and took the co, and we're fighting a co here. That said, yeah, you know, just just a moment. Let's do the armadillo then. Okay, so that said, Black could have won the co now. You might think. The I armadillo. Might. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Now, but this is a really efficient way for White to kill the rest of the Black stones. So in this case, White might actually play this way give black the three stones and that's a lot better for black 
but the left side is a lot better for white than before also i think white actually gained a stone there gained a move and so white gets to protect its six and again these these big captures in the center of the board you might say 30 points for ponuki 60 points for a troll shell if this is three stones maybe you would say it's 90 points but it doesn't work that way especially when white is alive on both sides so provided white can just live with this group on the right there's very little added value to this this black shape because white has such a solid territory on the left side so this is probably another example of black not succeeding but black just looks i mean black has has a has yeah it, it just looks terrible to me to, for black because black's lost a bunch of points in the corner actual countable yeah. points and then he has this group but it's, the group is not like what to your point it's not doing anything everything is alive right. exactly well it's very easy that said it's very easy to overestimate the value of these uh, captures in the center uh, of the board so, I was right. pointing that. so the, um black has to be conscious of that possibility all the time and by answering white's quote threat black managed to extend the liberties of this group on the left so that, that's making it more more work for white to try to kill that and of course black has a, a, a multitude of quotes there in the center and so white now white has um resigned itself to losing the co in the corner and is trying to get as much as possible on the outside so that's what this move is doing it's a case where white might try for for more um but actually yeah something like this uh this would be an extra move for black and so black, in this case black gets to surround the white group on the on the right and it's going to be pushed around a lot and black's going to get a big moyo on the right side of the board so this is the, you can see the one move difference making a a huge difference in this variation. So this is something that would actually be working for Black. It's an extra move that Black got. And that was all um, Black managed that with this Atari underneath at B13. So it's sort of problematic for White to try to win the cone now. Uh, the, the exciting thing about these um, super strong games that we're seeing with AI, with AIs and especially AlphaGo is that whether or not they actually want to win this co in the corner or any given co, it's very fluid. It depends on what they're giving up. So that that's uh, what a co is all about. It's a trade where you get something elsewhere on the board uh, in return for winning the co. Um, it's so easy to just simply think that you have to win this co and you finish it as soon as possible. Um, and AlphaGo here is showing us that it's not always the case. So at this point, White's strategy has simply changed to go ahead and kill the corner because White, White's not going to give up four stones in the center now. That, that would be a bit too much. Wow. So White's losing. White doesn't have any cool threats. Like all of those Black positions on the right side, they're relatively um, easy for Black just to, to leave. And anything White does, any two moves, they're, they're not that effective. So Black won the co. But you can also see that Black was giving up a lot in the center of the board in the process. And, and White managed to uh, get a nice position on the left side also. So White plays here, Black finishes the call. So we were saying that it was very unlikely that Black would win, kill the corner. And um, it's not true in actual practice. <laughs> wow. And this is actually pretty much even. So this was probably a bit hard going, like it was a lot of calculation and stuff. Um, but for a while now, it's going to calm down a little bit and it's going to be a bit more positional. So um, for those of you who are stressed out following all the complications, it is a bit easier now for a while. Can, can I can I just say, and, and, and folks, weigh in if you've got comments too. We're getting some good comments. So, you know, it's complicated. It's nuts. Uh, but what's kind of cool about this is that, yeah, it was really nerve wracking you know, watching that and trying to figure out what the heck was going on. But, you know, so black has this big corner, but then white has got this really nice position on the outside. And uh, is that looks like that upper right corner is in some deep trouble too, right? The upper right corner, um, no one knows whether it's alive or dead, really. Um, like, does white, black even want to try to live? So like if black wants to live, um, it could play something like this. And I'm not sure White's going to even try to kill this. Um, 
However, maybe black doesn't want to live and would rather play a forcing move on the right side and, and get a territory here. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's sort of hard to choose between these two variations. But in most cases, this is going to be better because if we look at the top side in general, it, it's got an open, what they call an open skirt. There's an open side there with the black stone peeking out at K18. Uh, that white territory is degraded in its value. That is valuable. Yeah, that makes because sense. That. So, so although the corner is a bit uh, away from that, it, it does rel relate to that weakness where black can jump in at a M18. And so maybe it's better for black to control the right side in this in this position. Yeah. But it started with a Kakari in the lower left corner. Um, how white can use this thickness in the center of the board towards the bottom side. That was that was important. So um, that's why black is looking towards the bottom side of the board at this point. That makes sense to me. So once the game gets positional, the choices that AlphaGo makes, and actually they're easier for me to, to explain because they're more positional and closer to what I would imagine is a kind of a human logic for how to continue my story for the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here White actually played away from the corner to finish the center. So the option, the other thing about this is that um, let's go back to this variation and black can s squeeze a little bit in the center. So all of those black stones trying to save them would not be good. So the, the worst stone to save would be maybe this one. Um, and it's just pointless to escape in that direction. But it's actually also bad to try to save these stones because they're not doing anything. They're, they're just making a heavy group. And so this would be bad too. And so the, the move that's relatively hard to find maybe is this move, which is not trying to save anything. And it's just going to be playing some forcing moves um, like this, for instance. And Black's controlling the right side of the board with some a kind of a line of stones there creating some kind of influence, some uh, some strength towards the bottom side too. So this is it, the move that White was preventing Black from playing. Yeah, you actually, you answered a question. I think this was from Eva Deep, if I'm not mistaken. I uh, asked a very good question about whether uh, those Black stones in the played out ladder will come into play later. And you're just explaining that, that yes. Right. It's really important to have the plan to, to sacrifice them instead of mm -hmm, trying to save mm -hmm. everything. And so... What Black was doing for the time being was it was just not bothering with them. But um, the next move would be surrounding from the center. So so the reason I was doing that jumping thing, let's see, where am I? Yeah, before that. The jumping thing, uh, this move, yeah. Because if Black had just pushed, then White would have been extending out in front of Black. And this right. would have a bad effect on the right side. So that's why Black was jumping and and sort of curling around from that side, because in this board position, the right side, making a good position on the right side is probably more important for black. Okay, so white prevented black from doing that. This is going to affect the right side and the bottom side and black um, black is now, so now, yeah. So that's the move I showed you. This is the more tight move where black has played a knight's move at R12 and then added a stone at R9. In the other variation, I was showing you a more loose move where Black forced with this. It's still threatening to play at R17. And this was working better because although it leaves an open side there, there's four spaces on the right side there between the Black Stone I've just played and the Black Stone at Q6. But if Black gets to squeeze in the center, like in that variation, see if I can find it still. No, I, I didn't. Uh, that's a different, oh dear. Let's get back to the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, in this variation, uh, sorry, uh, in this variation, I was showing you a large knight's move, which is more loose. Um, and that's working because black is squeezing and, and that's going right, to squeeze right. in the center is going to um, cover up, cover black's weakness on the right side. Okay, back to the game. So um, because white is so strong in the center now, black is playing a more conservative, a uh, more passive move on the right side. And this it's sort of starting to look like a territory there. Although, you know, these things are fluid, but it's, it's at least an area that's controlled by black. 
So you might notice that suddenly the moves are looking, at least to me, they're looking normal from a human per perspective. And I think once once we get into this kind of positional situation, um, it's a lot more easy to understand in that way. Right. And to that, and somebody was just asking something good that I was just thinking about too, just looking at this game at this point, If uh, what they're saying is that it feels like Black is ahead by a lot. And I think that's because... I mean, Black took profit in the upper left corner. Black has a really good position on the on the right. So Black has stuff that actually either is or looks a lot like territory. Right. White has the upper right corner, which there's a lot of white stones there, so it just doesn't look like that much. Mm -hmm. And and then and then has this kind of thickness uh, in the upper left, but it's kind of sprinkled with black stone. So it's kind of hard to see. Hard to see. Yeah, so that's something I, I say a lot about the difference between strong human players and AIs mm. is that I'm including myself here in the human <laughs> side. Yeah. Um, so the difference is that we count the territory and then we look at the position and we try to compare that. And it doesn't seem to work that way with AIs. Like the territory... Um, the position is, it just, it, it's evaluating the whole board position. So it, it doesn't really work that way in taking it piece by piece mm. the way we do. Mm -hmm. We, we, we're very good at assessing local positions. Um, let's see. I, I think it was a recent video when I said that actually, we're very good at assessing local positions and calculating, for instance, how big this black territory is. It's mm -hmm. something I could do if I sat down for a bit and remembered where the captured stones started to be. So like all of those are captured stones. Um, looks like it's about 35 points. So it's, we, it's very easy to quickly calculate that black territory. Uh, or we could say if this black territory on the right, uh, it, if it's actually going to turn into a territory, it's, it looks something like three by 10. So it's something like 30 points. So we, we suddenly have this idea that black has 65 points and where is white's territory? The only territory that we can count is that territory in the top right, which is going to be about 15 points at least. And then the rest is sort of fuzzy. It's, it's hard to tell. And so it's very easy to come to the conclusion that black is winning or black is ahead. And it turns out that it's actually very, it's a close game. Mm. Um, like I, I forget what Katago was saying, but, um, I think it's a, um, it was a half point game almost throughout. Wow. So most wow. of the time it was a half, it was saying this was a half point. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, it's just, um, the fact that computers don't actually assess the position as it is, but they're, um, they're making an average of results that the computer itself would get if it played against itself. Yeah, see, I, I must have miscounted because I was counting it as a one-point game, so I must have been off slightly. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, if you're <laughs> that point, yeah. Kidding! <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, right. So, again, Black is trying to make something... I love it. It's so cool. The uh, the important idea here is that Black is not trying to save a single stone here. Right, He's right. Trying to make some extra um, strength towards the center. So that's what Black is doing with this exchange. And it's working um, to a certain degree. So those Black's three stones, Black's not going to try to save them necessarily either. For the time being, they're just there, just sort of blocking White as White tries. The focus is on the lower right area where White has invaded O3. That's, that's the important part of the board. These black stones in the center, they're just sort of trying to interfere with the fight in the lower right. Mm. So black plays here. Um, this is an interesting move in, in, that a human would play sometimes also. So like the intuitive move, if black wants to reinforce the bottom side, this group that black has with the F3 and the J3 stone, this would be a way to play a two-space extension and reinforce it. However... The whole idea with white O3 was that white was thinking of trading into the corner, the right. lower right corner. Right. And so black, uh, if we imagine that this was a human being, black would be imagining a position where white has taken away black's territory in the lower right corner. So for instance, 
Um, I actually probably have a variation for that. So like that, this would be the standard way for white to do it. Mm -hmm. And let's have white. Uh, let's have it uh, this variation. For instance, this this sort of demonstrates. It's a variation that can sometimes be played. Something like this. In a position like this, um, the position of this black stone. So a human, a strong human player would be imagining something like this on the right in the corner where white has taken away the whole corner territory. And where does black want this stone to be? Obviously the closer, the wider uh, the position, the better. But um, playing on the fourth stone, on the fourth line there at L4, it's working a lot better than the stone at M3 would be. Yeah. So it's working well enough. And of course, this is not the only variation that black has to worry about, but it's the most likely uh, a human player like myself would be thinking something like this, something along this line, at least white strategy would be something like this. So black wants the stone on the fourth line. Um, so it, it's um, working uh, that way. So there's, there's the assumption that white's going to jump into the corner. There's also the fact that for the time being, black does want to deprive this stone at O3 from the option of extending at L3. So it, it's inter interfering with white's extension along the side while staying high in preparation for white erasing the corner. Hmm. And in the game variation, it's going to be about equal whether black is played on the fourth or third line. So the variation I just showed you is the important one where white erases the corner and black gets a moyo on the bottom side. Okay. So this move, I've never seen it before. Wow. <laughs> it's a weird, it's a very strange move. Uh, I would say that that variation where white tries to erase the corner is the main line here. So um, I do want to go in. This is the one that I think people will gain some knowledge out of if they don't know it already. So for instance, when white plays the three, three point here, it's one of the standard ways in which white can attack this Shimari uh, by starting with the stone at 03 and attaching here. This is a standard combination play that white does all the time. And it, this is the variation, although AlphaGo didn't play it, this is the variation that I would want you to, to learn if you didn't know it. So if black extends, this is a safe move. It reverts to a black playing having a stone at the star point at two to start with and white jumping into the three three point and so you could assume that either uh, black has played two as in the game position or maybe black has played this marked stone at q3 just now after white had invaded the three three point that's how i like to imagine it and white's going to get a fairly nice life here so this is a joseki but it works really well for white when white is erasing a territory a potential territory on the right uh, right side so I like this for white. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, a more strong move for black would be covering here. So that's the variation I was just showing you. Although I'm not sure whether black's going to play like this and get into that variation uh, that I was just doing. Let's see, what, what about the ladder? The ladder doesn't work for black, does it? Oh, it does work for black. So white yeah. can't do that. So when black has played those stones in the center, uh, white would have to change to this variation. And it would be, maybe white would play the co actually, because black doesn't have any co-threats. So in this case, when the ladder favors black, white has to play this way. Mm. Yeah, so I, I might have made a mistake earlier, but I, I I was still just trying to show you the, the general idea anyway. Uh, otherwise, white can play here. So this, this might revert sort of to that variation if black takes the one stone. And white would then be playing this variation. So it would go back to a similar variation there. And again, in this case, black would be happy that the stone is rather than having it on, at M3 it's, it's good that it's on the fourth line at least okay so white plays here and then plays the 3-3 three, three point and you would usually think this is so this actually alleviates the problem with the ladder because if black plays here in that previous position the ladder actually favored black so um, that's probably one of the main reasons it did that order. So in this case, black has actually captured the white stone in a ladder. It's going to hit those three black stones in the center. Uh, but in the game, when white started with an attachment here, it's not a ladder anymore. 
So in this case, you would see black playing here. And like this would be a bit painful. This would be a better position for white in the corner. But black doesn't really have time to play this Atari right now because stuff has started in the center of the board. Um, so if black plays down here, just to show you one more variation. In this case, white would curl around here and the corner and the outside or me eye. So something like this. This would be a fairly good result for white because there's still some Aji on the bottom side there. Okay, enough variations. Well, I'm going to show you more anyway. But anyway, so black bumped against white and white played a hunter. So usually you would think that stone at Q5 is really bad because like it's a it's a dead stone. Why did white lose a stone like that? Um, if you were comparing it to the variation where white gets to do this, obviously it's a bad exchange. However, if we get into that variation where white gets to um, erase the right side, it's actually not going to be so bad anymore. Because when capture when black captures it, white gets to erase the whole right side. So that, that extension at six is a pretty valuable move in itself. But if black, uh, instead, if black plays here, it re sort of reverts to the joseki and white hasn't lost anything. And so this is an example of the Q5 stone, which looks so terrible in some of the variations. It's not becoming a bad move at all. It's, it's just reverting to the Josek. It's becoming a normal move. So this is an example of how it could work for white. And it's also the reason that black didn't go into that variation. OK, so black's going to play here. Now black's actually going to allow white to live on the bottom side. And in doing so, has punished that white stone at Q5 by capturing it. So that's increased. The exchange, obviously, has increased Black's territory by a certain degree. And it's another even trade. Um, importantly, Black has got Sente. So Black gets to change to the left side. It's still a very close game. Um, so Black has kept most of the right side. And White's probably not going to try anything there now. It's probably too late for white to do that. Um, and black is a race to the left side. So black is accomplishing stuff while white managed to live on the bottom side. So it's another even trade. And now black is starting to build the center. So yep. black is trying to make a territory here in the center. But you might notice that all of black's shapes are a bit loose. So there's some holes in it. And so how that is handled is going to be the focus of then game. Nice. So Black's trying to um, straighten up the line, but this is a very good way for White to reduce the territory. So like it, it looks like a bad shape move because it's sort of off out out there. So like if you're the kind of player who just knows good shapes and doesn't calculate, you might think like this, um, something like this. But this would make it easier. It would make it possible for Black to get a big. But, big I, but I want to back up for just a sec so to where Black starts to sketch out that territory. Yeah. Uh, maybe back even just a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, go one more for Black. White crawl. This is a big move. Covering right. there would put, have an effect on the corner. Right. So Black plays there, White plays there, and then Black does the right. H10. Mm-hmm. So and everybody so, would not be playing so close to a strong white position. Right. Um, but there is the fact that uh follow up here can sometimes be a bit annoying if white isn't doing anything in the vicinity. And also there's the fact that there's not so much of the board left for the players to play. So black's just trying to get as much as possible um in this lower left part of the center. So what I'm looking at is that we can all see now that where Black is trying to sketch, it's very obvious where Black is trying to sketch out his territory. And the, the uh, what Bruce Wilcox used to call the, the seam line runs between the H10 stone and the E6 stone. So if you draw a line across it's there. Sort of these four stones, yeah, that are trying to connect up to make a borderline. Right. So you would think that White would try something in that, area to a race i don't know i'm just uh i yeah. mean like like that, like um, in the game white played away once um maybe white didn't have to hurry so much because 
Um, White actually has, let's just get rid of all these marks. White has multiple ways to do it. So one of them would be to play here. So for instance, something like this would, it would split, actually split off the black group on the right while getting into the center. And if black counterattacks like this, um, white's still gonna be able to get out. And so this is one of the ways white can, white could have done it immediately. And for a human player, even a professional such as myself, it's it's hard to say why white should not do it right now. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to say it. Um, I'd say that this is, for myself, if I was playing a game, this would be equal equally feasible because I can see the value of white playing this exchange in the center also. It's um, starting to make some territory in the top side and it is, uh, to a great degree, it's reducing the value of black's area on the right side of the board because something black could do just to give a passive move for white um, to make things easier for me. Um, black could also be doing stuff like this. Well, maybe that's an overplay or stuff like this um, to start building on the right half of the center. Mm. So that's also an option that black has. Um, and so white's stopping black from doing that. And I think the idea in it for the only way I can explain it is that white can bide its time for the time being. There's, there's still options that white has on the left side. So while I would have been attracted to this move with the idea that maybe I could even attack black on the bottom side. I, I think that um, I can see the value of this move where white still has multiple ways. Basically it's the F5 move I've been showing you, this one, and the move that comes up in the game later, this one. So white has two options there and is making me eye of them. And quite often in a position where I have an impulse to try to attack, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, AIs don't go for that when it's not so material where, where there's no actual value uh, that can be calculated um, hmm. so in a position where I would want to attack and the computer tells me just play a big move uh, when I really get into it I do f often find that the attack is not really paying off and it's it's more valuable not to do that. So th this is a position where I would be, uh, sorry, I would be considering the idea that this could actually maybe attack those black zones on the bottom side and, uh, or the left side, it could be a double attack. So I would be very excited to try something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it might be a bit too, um, a bit too, um, maybe a bit of an overplay, a bit too um, expecting too much of the attack. It's fascinating because, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, my instinct is with you that I really want to get in there, but but, but seeing the way that, that AG plays it out, I mean, it, it makes sense, but I, I, I would really, I'd really like that move of yours. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the val um I wouldn't be surprised if the score would not go down so far if you played that way. Um, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Checked it. Yeah, but um, obviously, since AlphaGo chose to play this way, this is probably a bit better, but it would be a very small difference. Okay, okay. That's my my gut feeling. Okay, so black plays here and white plays here uh, and here. So uh, let's see. Uh, after those forcing, this is the move I was trying to point out. Um, a very Oof. effective way of reducing oh. the center. Yeah. Although like it, the fact that white is so strong there in the center makes it okay for black to allow black to push through here. Um, it's just right next to a white wall. So here, yeah, they played that exchange in here. So black's still trying to surround the center, but white does have this move here, which can reduce it. But white's already reduced it to a certain degree, so it's a very fine line. Um, and yes. again, I, I would have just jumped out here. It's a, it's a very similar to the previous um, position where I would have been playing the local active move. Mm -hmm. um, I would have just jumped out here, um, but AlphaGo is okay with this game move. Because the the jump out is is a pretty sente ish, right? It looks like it's attacking black. Yeah, and that's where things get a bit exciting. But it looks like it's attacking black, and you don't really know exactly how it's going to turn out. But you have the feeling that it's going to be good for white, right? Right. And in actual human games, 
quite often it will be good for white because black black's not a computer um but it's it's, it's actually pretty hard to tell exactly right. what's going to come from that attack okay. so white's playing a more solid move which is building um there's a white territory here in the center which is starting to form up so like if we imagine a line here this is actually pretty big i was just going to ask about that that's a that's a tidy little profit there that black mm -hmm. could have uh erased a lot of that if, he, if black got a chance well the black move erasing it is not so productive so like white started that with this thing here so making that's the value of white's playing here strongly in the center and white's moves are pretty easy and intuitive right the, these mm -hmm, moves are mm -hmm. pretty natural um but black's move would be something uh so it would be something more like black has to be really careful not to get up cut off so like if black's too adventurous uh then then black has to sorry i'm using the wrong tool here if black's too adventurous then let's see whose turn is it sorry i messed up okay so instead of this move if black is playing some uh something like this yeah that was that was way too far out but you see what i'm trying to say here if black's too adventurous um black does have an issue with trying to connect up here and so it could uh, possibly be a problem just because there's so many white stones in the vicinity um, interesting be, wow yeah so black has to be a bit careful there if black's going to play a stone black doesn't want to get cut off so black has to play something a bit conservative and actually black's territory is not going to increase very much because of that i see okay and All so right. it's not a productive move for black it's just destructing white's potential so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's less attractive than the, the move played in the game which is this one okay so white's starting to build that and black by uh saving that stone at r14 black is still threatening to jump out in the center so there's something happening there but now uh white has played the the value of this move is slightly reduced <laughs> because it's only partly getting into the center. So like there would be a potential coal starting here if black cuts it 011. So that sort of depends on the coal threats, but there's, um, or otherwise if white doesn't have any coal threats, white would be backing up. But you can see how white's center has, it's shrunk a bit. Mm -hmm. For the it, In general, white has managed to surround the center. So you can see how this exchange, it has taken white forwards a little bit in the in the area of the center so white's white needs one more stone to finish this borderline but it's um it's a bit more difficult for black to race than it was before right it's like 20 points close to 20 points i think right mm -hmm. oh, so you were counting there yeah so so having played that exchange and uh by the way black's move here was it's a really big move uh the previous move was necessary to save the two stones so black saved the two stones and continued with this move which finished black's territory on the right it's a pretty big move so like if white had played that point um then later on uh, uh don't pay much attention to black three and five that's probably not a good move anyway but um white would eventually <laughs> be um threatening to to cut with a stone at q12 so um, there's a, a potential cutting point here which could be a problem and there's also the fact that even if black handles that so like a like if black played this way it would be handling that weakness uh because of a uh, shortage of liberties here so white wouldn't be able to do that uh however the fact that at the very least white has a forcing move here it means that white's line in the center now there's no weakness there so the white line in the center is, is finished that's a white territory now hmm. So if white plays at two, then the, the forcing move at 10. The bottom line is that that is finishing the center plus some annoyance value with white jumping in at six. So there's double value there. So that's why black's move here was a big move. I'm oh, sorry, this one. It's a half point difference, by the way. If you <laughs> believe Kadogo, it's a half point difference throughout this end game. Oh my God. So white jumps out. But pretty soon we're going to be get, get, getting some Sumego practice. So okay, um, all right, yeah. okay, sharpen up your Sumego, despite folks. the fact that it's a half point difference. Okay, 
So Black's group on the left here was starting to get isolated. Um, Black's move here, putting some pressure on the corner. So after this, B3 is going to be a thing that we're going to be looking at. So um, by playing here, for the time being, white has gotten rid of that weakness. So um, if Black plays here now, and you know, any strong player would be imagining the peak and then trying to think what to do next, right? That that would it just seems natural. Mm. But um we're actually gonna see black sometimes not playing the peep, but however black does it, actually attaching it d3, d2 there is the better move. But however black does it, black's not gonna get a living shape, and white is going to win the race to capture. So right. um for the time being, it's not working for black. And so that's what this move for white was doing. It was taking away that that weakness. And so black is starting to make a base on the right on the left side. Uh, don't forget to correct me when I get right and left wrong. I I, I say that wrong so many times. And it's embarrassing. You're you're doing fine. Okay, so here white is improving the lower right corner. So like. Um, I think playing here, this would start to make a base for black on the bottom side, and it would also be forcing white to live in the corner. So these two points, they're pretty much me I. Uh, if black plays one, white has to play the other. White doesn't, although white would not die, it would be extremely painful if black got to play both of these points. And white would be forced to, to live on a small scale. And so um, in the game, white played this move, which was putting pressure on black while improving the white group in the lower right. And black is trying to deal with it like this. Okay, so this is a big move, obviously. It captures the two black stones in a snapback, and it is isolating the black group on the side. So this black group is gonna turn into a life and death problem. Okay, let's see, where am I? I have so many variations, it's hard to tell where I am. Okay, this is a point where um, it got really tactical. <laughs> so obviously, I wanted to see what happens if Black plays a more reasonable looking move. Right. So playing here. I've been thinking about that connect. Like it, yeah. So this is going to sort of connect the Black Stones. It's going to do a lot. It's going to do good for the Black group and the center also because there's always the issue of white playing here and playing here cutting black off at the same time it's going to start putting pressure on the black group on the right side of the center also mm. so um there's a lot of value in black playing here because it captures this white stone making a solid shape for black on that side yep white can actually cut black off here uh, but black will be able to live so this group on the left now it's just a simple living shape it's it's not it's not even a life and death really it's a, just alive so that's that's the easy um the three black stones can be captured but it's not an issue now cuz black has a very safe position um this is actually going to be a half point difference actually I, um i was thinking actually maybe black is i actually went into the end game a little bit and I was thinking maybe Black's going to win by half a point. Um, but I'm sort of guessing here. Although like, it, there's not so much space left, it's still difficult for me to calculate. So um, it's probably something like 70 to 100 moves left in the game at this point. So it's it's a lot of calculation. You think, I think historically there were some players who could calculate this end, end game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we're actually doing it. Like in, in the Edo era, three or 400 years, well, 300 years ago, um, or 200 years ago, in the golden age of the Edo era of Go, um, the players did not have time controls. And so they actually had the leisure to work these end games out. So in the games that were important, they played perfect end games. You're talking and about those, extreme, like the castle games that went on for castle days. Castle games. Um, and they these, these games lasted for days or sometimes months or years. And and there were relatively important games that they played outside the castles also. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they were just uh, the serious games that could go on for very long periods of time. And they researched Endgame and they played a perfect Endgame. So like the quality of the games is actually better than modern games because wow. of that. Wow. Of course, the openings are completely different. So we can't really gain. Maybe maybe you can because like there's some things that are sort of coming back with the AIs. Like the mm-hmm. But like that would have been the the more end game like end game and it would have been very close and i was thinking maybe black's going to win by half a point but you know partially i'm relying on Patagol for that um assumption so it's it's not like i really completely have researched it i don't know about the time controls that um AlphaGo had i think that the fact that um uh, that was a question that was just coming up in the chat so i was seeing it oh, okay um, the question was um the question was did they have time controls or an hour oh about the castle games. actually he's asking about the cat yeah they're they're asking about the castle castle games games, um you know actually the castle games were played in front of the shogun so the the leader of the country at least in the beginning was actually watching these games because he was an avid go player um i'd say he was about four stones to a professional player like myself um and he actually enjoyed watching those games and because the 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 person who started that kind of dynasty of the edo era um was so such an avid go player his descendants who also ruled the country it was a family lineage um they they had to follow his example so although some of his descendants did not enjoy go they had to pretend they were enjoying these castle games so they actually had to watch them at least for a certain part of the game (laughs) um um so these were played so obviously um there was a kind of a time limit because they had to leave the castle um when it got late at night but they actually um when they were actually playing the games at the castle when the the competition was actually happening at the castle they would then go to some lord's house or estate and they would continue the game there so there would be someone responsible to sort of be watching them as they played the games. Um, and they would they would go through the night. So there was a period where they were actually playing the games for the first time at the castles, and they did that. So they would leave the castle when the time came, and they would continue the game elsewhere on the same night. And they weren't allowed to leave. They weren't allowed to go home, because if they went home, they would be asking people about the game. Right. Or you might assume so. Um, but then after that, there was a period where they wanted to abbreviate the castle games and they they pre-played them. So they played the game before the castle game thing. And then they went to the castle and they were just replaying the moves. So in, in those cases, they could relatively quickly play the games and, and uh, the lords who didn't want to spend their whole day watching well, didn't have to. They were basically like performing the games. They were performing, they were replaying them. But, um, they were um, recreating the games that they had already played. So there was, it, it depends on what part of that era you're talking about cool. okay but i i don't know what the um what i was almost um, going to answer was the time controls that master that uh, AlphaGo had right 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 because i don't know and the fact that it could play the same opening for instance in this game and choose a different move um one thing that i sort of hypothesize is that maybe um because I see AIs coming up with different moves if I let them think for a while. The more calculation it does in really complicated positions, the first answer that comes out from an AI can change to a different answer if I let the computer compute for, say, 30 minutes or an hour. The longer it computes, sometimes it gets different answers. Sometimes it doesn't change, but in really complicated positions, the computer can change its mind, which means it was lying to us to start with. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or at least it was wrong, um, according to itself. It changes its mind with more calculation, so it's more uh, replays of the game, or more um, playouts, that is. It, it, cha- it can actually change its mind. And so the move that it was originally suggesting can actually just disappear. It doesn't even show a spot for it. Um, you know how these computers, they, they show spots for the moves they're thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so... The time controls could be an issue here where AlphaGo started with the same opening and it played a different move here in the upper left corner. Um, that could be one 
hypothetical reason, although I'm not sure it's true. Uh, and I don't think they are telling anyone about the time controls in these games yeah. that Alpha played against itself. But I would suppose that some of them would, most of them would be sort of lightning games. Um, and more lightning than you would assume from human, like really, really quick. But then these games that they're actually showing us might be on longer time. They might be allowing the computer to spend more time thinking about it because they're very high quality games. Yeah. Okay. So, so the answer is the bottom line is I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were more than one time control, which could be influencing the difference in the moves that we're seeing here. Okay. So black jumped out. So this was the relatively safe move, which would probably, um, I'm guessing it would lead to a half point difference. And like if I, what I said was maybe black's going to win by half a point. Um, it's pushing it, but it's going to be very close anyway. So in the game, black jumped out and white is starting to attack black here. So white actually starts with this move, which is um, sort of looking at both the cut at G5 here. So this cut, and also the fact that at any point white can cut here also. So white's just leaving that for later. And so by playing at K4, white is um, making a new way that the cut here can work. So like um, white can actually cut at um, H6 also. If black is connecting on this side, white could cut on this side also. So there's various ways black can be cut off. Uh, so by playing at K4, white is taking away some space from black in the center, while in actuality, white has already managed to cut black off. So black answered here and white jumped once. And so again, this is a point where black could have defended. Let's see, defended like this maybe. And we would go back to an end game. Um, but if we compare this with um, the previous position, black's territory in the center has disappeared and he's, he's playing dame points basically. He, he did get a, some territory on the left, but that territory is not real either because <laughs> white can still do this. And so that that ter some of that territory is going to disappear. So like in a variation, something like this, where black would be alive, but white would be getting half of that territory. So mm. even though the left side looks like blacks gained something, it's not really true. And so this this would be another close end game. But um, uh, Kadago was saying that this was actually a small lead for white, while in the previous variation where I said it was close, it was looking like a small lead for black. Um, so I haven't researched it deeply, but um, that's what I can tell you. So Black played here. So Black's keeping a, a lead in territory here. And now it's really um, getting seriously dangerous because if Black survives, then maybe Black's going to have a decisive lead in territory, provided nothing terrible happens in the process. Mm. Mm. And White is going to cut Black off. Yes. Okay. So this Black group, what do you think? I have been worried about that black group for so long. I, I can't even tell you. I, I it it looks very. I mean, I'm assuming it's alive, but uh, it looks uh -huh. really it looks right. really dicey well, yeah. to me. After all, it's AlphaGo, so we, you yeah, right. right. Alive. But 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 uh, but gun to my head, if I had to make it live, mm, I don't right. know. So the thing is that this black group, it depends on some Aji in the corner. For it to be alive uh-huh so if we were to sort of make it like those problems that you find in a life and death book then it would be relatively easy for white to kill this group because white just plays here and then all white has to worry about is stopping black from connecting so like if black plays here white has to add a stone or if black captures the white stone white has to make sure black doesn't connect up there and Black doesn't have the space to live. Black's just dead. Black is just dead. Dead, but, yeah, dead, dead. Kind of caught me sort of sneakily adding these two stones to White. Uh, White really needed only one. But uh, the thing is, uh, if White plays there. So Black has a forcing move here, right? And White has a weakness in the corner here. So now it's time to show you a diagram. The first diagram for the corner. Now, there's going to be more, but for the time, I, I'll do it once, one at a time, right? So uh, whether black starts with two or four, 
the combination, it sort of forces white to cut black off anyway. And again, a strong player would just assume this exchange and then start thinking about what happens in the corner. That would be a terrible mistake. Excuse me. Ah, bless you. Mm. Actually, black wants to play here. So the thing is that sometimes, instead of playing at c3, sometimes black wants to use the forcing move at a3. Sometimes black just wants to leave that space at c3 open. So for instance, um, like this. And black's going to win the race to capture. So in this case, let's just uh, let's just keep it simple. It's a case of an eye against no eye, which means oh, yeah, there's a great... liberties belong to black. And that black group on the left, it's it's got a lot of liberties, so it's going to be okay. That's a five stone shape, so it's going to take something like um, eight moves. Well, white's played two moves inside, so it's something like six moves inside there, and then there's something like four or five, four liberties on the outside. So it's something like 10 moves that black, 10 liberties that black black has there. So there, the black didn't have to worry about that black group on the left side in the case of a race to capture. So playing at six is a really neat move that sort of makes use of that forcing move while not playing it outright. So that was sort of neat. Yeah, very neat. Um, so... So that's why that's not working for white. And um, so the bottom line is that that black group is, for the time being, it's alive, depending on that weakness that white has in the corner. So uh, this is another way that white might try to kill the black group. Um, in that um, basic life and death that I was showing you before, this would be the uh, the best answer. And this would be the mistake. <laughs> because... One way that black can live is by playing here and expanding it to a to make a, a seki. So this would be a seki. And black's second chance would be if black didn't see the seki, black could play here and make a call, although this would be a bit painful. So one it's sometimes it's a tesuji, like it's it's usually a better move than playing here, which would give black multiple ways to live. So for instance, even this would be alive. It would be a seki too. Uh, so playing at one um, would not be as good a move as playing the diagonal move here, which is sometimes a good move. But um, in this case, it doesn't work because black has the forcing the forcing move at a11 there that expands black's shape. So there's no way for white. So this is was black white's best choice, white's best try, but because of dodgy in the corner. So this black group, just remember, it depends on dodgy in the corner. It's a very important thing. Mm. So now we get to talk about the black group on the right. Okay, so this black group, the life or death of this black group, it actually depends on Samaji in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so you might start getting worried. I'm seeing a theme here. <laughs> seeing a theme here. Yeah. And so the Dodgy in the corner I'm talking about. Uh, okay. Yeah, is this thing. Let's take it up to this point. So at this point, white starts stuff on that side. I'm, I already told you that move doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So let's have white try to kill the black group on the right. So white's going to play, uh, since black had some escape potential there in the center, white's going to play a defensive move here um, at L5. And the question is, does black mm. have enough space to live? Mm. And I'm going to show you a different variation in the corner, where instead of playing here, which, um, since black does not have a stone at a5, this would actually be a one-move win for white. But black would squeeze it, right? So maybe white doesn't want black to squeeze. There's another way white can deal with this attachment at d2, which is better in this case, and it's to play here. And then connect. So white's sort of forcing black to play that stone at 4. In this case, black gets a squeeze here. So I'm losing my, but the fa the bottom line is the black gets this forcing move. I'm not even sure if I'm in my prepared variation. Okay. Oh, that's a different variation. So black gets a forcing move at eight. 
and then black will play here. And it's still not clear what's happening with this black group, but um, it doesn't actually have room for two eyes, but black has, and you remember I played a defensive move with white one. However, white plays this move, this stone at L4 is gonna be annoying. So in this case, black extends here, threatening a cut at K3 and black gets an extra forcing move here. Actually, there's a co if white plays here. This is, I'm, I'm just playing around here now. If white plays at 19, there's a co here because uh, black doesn't want to do that. So it is a co, but black has this huge co threat here. So that's, that's going to be okay for black. And so white ends up having to protect on the right and black has room to live. So black has made use of the Aji in the corner to, to live on the side. So um, just going back to the starting position, um, if white cannot play on the outside like this and kill black, which did not work out, right? If white cannot do that, black, white really has no way to attack the black group because if mm. white does something like this, black has these forcing moves on the outside. You can sort of imagine a variation like this where it's very easy for black to connect up to the right. It's just not a problem for black. So white has to be able to play a stone on the outside and take away black's eyes nonetheless. If white plays at one, it's, for the time being, it's difficult for black to, to connect out. So like if we just look at the center position, there's too much distance between that black group and the black stones on the right side. Black can't escape. But because of th these forcing moves black has against the corner, um, black is alive on the bottom side. So that's the variation I was just showing you, but you probably noticed that I'm making use of Dodgy in the corner twice. I did. I was <laughs> doing, yes, yes, yes. It's... So that's the problem. Yeah. So um, I told you this move was not working. Um, actually, Black's life or death, even though White played here, it still depends on Black's forcing move at A5 because black has already played that exchange at B4. So like if black had not, it's a case of AlphaGo doing it just because um, it also works. So like it would have been um, easier for me to understand if black had played here, if white had played here. But um, in the case where black does this, now white, because of the stone, white stone at A4, white has time to curl around here before white plays this move. So without that exchange, White would not have had time to play at a5, but because of the fact that White has a stone at a4 here, it, it's threatening to connect up. Mm. And so that's that's how the Seki is not working for Black anymore. So Black would have liked to be able to do this. And again, this this move at seven, it's a forcing move. And so in actual play, White would have to defend the corner at this point. Mm -hmm. And Black would be able to live, but then the right side would die. So that's how black needs this Aji in the corner twice, and it only gets to use it once to, to live. Wow. And the alternative would be to play this ko. So white's giving that that opportunity, but the ko is just too pain. It's not it's not gonna be good. In this case, white would just have a, a few zillions of ko threats towards the ko, the black group on the right there, and then <laughs> there would be no way for it to live one of these black groups is going to die. Cool. Okay. Yes. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So, by sort of mixing between the attack on the left side and the attack on the right side, the actual order of the moves, it doesn't matter anymore. So, but wait, was, has White has white gotten some, some sort of value out of this, an extra half point or point? The black group is dead, so it's 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 not a half point. It's it's, it's just a crash for black. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I got it. All right. Wow. White, white, white. It, it, the funny part is that like it's it's alpha go. So like a human player like myself would usually take this in a orderly fashion, and um and go into that variation like that I was showing you, um, where the final move, the decisive move here, is threatening to kill the left side or the right side. Yeah, so this would be the orderly fashion that a human player would play it, so as not to make some stupid mistake in the process. I see, and okay. it would be very easy to see that white is threatening to kill the back on the left side or the right side. 
Got it. But the way AlphaGo does it, it it's just um, changing the order of the moves in various fashions. Um, and it's not playing in a straightforward way. And so you might say that most of these moves, they're not really meaning anything. They're, they're, it, the order of the moves is not so important because whatever way it's played, it's going to end up in the same same crash for black. So you can see how like all that Aji I was showing in the corner, uh, the key points at B3 and D2, black played them. But ultimately, this move that white plays at E3, it's going to be a double threat. And so it's dead. Wow. Yeah. So uh, again, that's another version of the, um, the semi in the corner. Um, but you see that the, the way white, um, white managed to get black to play this move and the, the way that black made an eye in the corner black was filling all the inside most of the inside liberties so <laughs> it was a less efficient way so just to go back there um if we compare it for instance just going back all the way if we compare it to um making an eye some this is another potential so like if we say that was forcing and black gets to play this move this would be a way of making an eye in the corner mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without filling any of the inside liberties. And in this case, black would actually win the race to capture. So by using the forcing move at A3, sometimes black can make a an eye like this with a lot of inside liberties. But in the game, black was forced to play this move or ended up playing that move. So the way black made his eye there in the corner, it filled up all the inside liberties pretty much. And that, that made the, the semi, white's going to win the semi without even giving up these stones. So white still has two liberties and black has only one eye. So it was a, actually it turned out to be a crash. I did not see that coming. So we started really tactically complicated in the top or left corner. Mm -hmm. And then it became more positional in the middle game. But they ended up um, killing each other in the end. <laughs> What an amazing game. And, and, and as usual, Michael, you know, what's so wonderful and, and, you know, just thinking about this, that people have been talking in the chat about, you know, cause you know, the original games against Lisa Dollar, what, six years ago now. Right. You know? And, and so. Maybe seven we, years. Seven, eight seven, years. Yeah. So. I think 2017, I think that was KJ actually. So it wasn't Lisa at all. 2016. We yes. can't even remember. It was before yeah, the pandemic. Was you know, the, so it was about seven years. Yeah. Seven. So seven years ago when we first saw this. And then, uh, but, but it's given one of the things is that it's, you know, and now you have tools that you're able to use and, you know, to, to do this sort of deep analysis, uh, looking at, at these games and looking at this variations. Um, it's just, it's just a real treat. Um, I think, mm -hmm. I think we all feel that way. So, um, thank you for doing that. But it's it's these you know, AlphaGo AlphaGo games are just so fascinating in in the the, the way that they move. You know, dur during the course of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, the the thing I get from it is the way that like it's so carefree about losing groups and stuff like that. <laughs> um, like I would be, I think the the human player tends to have more emotions. Mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. these fights and it makes it a lot more difficult to have the correct positional judgment for instance in this game for white to just decide to sacrifice to, to white is going to lose the coin the top left corner um was like it's almost like it was a conscious decision it, mm. if a human had played this game um uh, white would be at some point in this fight white would, would have decided that it's okay to lose the top left corner and making that decision is, emotionally is a very difficult thing to do Yes. Yes. No, I think, and I think, you know, that, that, uh, my understanding certainly, uh, you know, with amateurs, I, I'm sure for professionals as well is uh, that that's one of the lessons of, of the AI is being, 
um, I think a bit more flexible in the thinking, right? Hopefully, maybe maybe being a little bit more open to that. Just because, like the it assesses the full board position, you might say, or at least right. like, looking at end results, and so the result is much less focused on local positions. But humans, in order to understand a position, we have to understand the local position first. And so the way we sort of diagnose these positions is completely different from the way an AI does it. And it, and that's that's the difference in the results we're, we're seeing here. The, the way it doesn't seem to cure is because that's not even an issue. It's, it's not an issue to start with. It doesn't have to care. It's an AI. It's a point. So. Well, Michael, thank you so much. As always, great, uh, great analysis, uh, detailed. I think everybody got their money's worth tonight for sure. Um, just a reminder, uh, this is brought to you by the American Go Association. So those of you who are members, thank you for, for being uh, part of the Go Association. And uh, you can go to usgo.org and uh, check out the membership. Lots of other cool stuff there. Uh, and of course, uh, if you liked uh, what Michael's offering here, uh, you're going to want to check out his, uh, he's got his own channel. Yep. So you could, you, if uh, this is not enough, uh, Michael Redmond, there's lots more where that came from of all different levels, I should say. Uh, this is kind of a super dose, uh, but, but but I think it's, it I'd love it. But, it has to be, there's, there's no <laughs> yeah, choice, yeah. but, but on your channel, you go, you have lots of just fun, much, much easier stuff. So mm -hmm. um, check that out uh, as well. Um, uh, Eva D has put that. We have to thank Eva D, who's been our producer once again. Thank you, Eva D, for, for just doing a wonderful job uh, making sure that we can get out there. We will be back. Um, oh, yes, and, and, and Michael has a Patreon also because uh, this kind of thinking does not come free. So mm -hmm. support Michael in that way. Uh, we'll be back in a month. I'm doing this from memory, but I think it's Friday the 18th, somewhere around there. Anyway, make sure you subscribe to the e-journal. We will have notice of that uh there so in the meantime everybody have great holidays be safe out there thanks again michael and thank you all it's so much 19th. for watching the 19th uh, yeah i was i was one point off <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks everybody take care happy holidays